so start recording and uh, yes welcome to lab number eight the last regular lab on our schedule and uh, as you might or might not have seen this time i didn't prepare a pdf for the lab instructions i just made two pages on studium and uh, or three pages two and a half pages i just copied one page which i put up earlier already and uh, so let's first have a look what this is supposed to be about and so the first part i want to use to show you experimentally the sleep modes and how we can put a microcontroller into a low power sleep mode um, i was hoping to be able to actually measure the difference in power consumption but it is not as easy as i was hoping and uh, so i would have to modify a usb cable i will possibly do this before the q and a sessions and then i will record this and also put it online but uh, one difficult thing, of course, is with sleep modes that when the microcontroller is not doing anything, we have a hard time seeing that it's not doing anything. So the code examples which I put up will show us not when the microcontroller is sleeping, but when it's waking up. And uh, then we sh have to deduct from the uh, behavior which we observe that it actually works or doesn't work and so well what i have here up here is our uh, Arduino board and uh, the connectors and uh, we are supposed to be connecting one led each and uh, its corresponding series resistor between the pins pd0 and pd1 and ground so well, let's start with this and uh, go our way forward then through the instructions. New breadboard, uh, Arduino with unknown code in it. Um, two LEDs like this and two resistors like this. Oh, you don't see them. Here they are. And uh, well, PD0 and PD1 are these two and the ground pin is right next to it. So the first thing I do is I put ground up on the blue rail here with one black wire. And uh, then I put the LEDs somewhere. Um, let's say I put and, and the long end, these are unclipped LEDs. So the long wire is plus. I put the first one here and the second one here and a resistor between ground and the short leg and a resistor between ground and the short leg like this and now two wires from PD0 here and from PD1, let's take a yellow wire like this. So we will be working a lot in software in the first part, but we need something to see. Actually, I, I was thinking of outputting something to the USB, but then I remembered that the USB is, of course, interrupt driven as well and would interfere with our sleeping uh, process here. So um, yeah, we will not go this way. Then um, we are also supposed to connect a push button between PB0 and ground. PB0 is on the other side. I have one of our push buttons here, put it here and it should be connected between PB0 and ground. Let's use yet another color. We take a blue wire 
put that wire here so that I still can reach the reset button comfortably and also ground it. I'll ground it up here as well because I already have my ground up there. I will move it a little bit further down so that I can touch it a bit easier. So, and of course, one more thing to do then is later, instructions didn't tell you, but uh, well, I mean, yes, of course we have to connect it to the USB. And I have no idea what code is running in there, if there is always some code running in it, but doesn't matter. So I divided this into two code examples, wake up by timer interrupt and wake up by pin change interrupt. But uh, let's perhaps have first a look into the sleep modes again. And uh, we can do this by having a look into the full data sheet. Oops, open in Firefox, yes. Um, the full data sheet or actually uh, just the registers. I extracted a separate PDF file. These are only all the registers and interesting stuff from the data sheet. Uh, 78 pages still, but uh, a little bit less than the 438 pages of the full uh, documentation. And chapter seven is about the sleep modes. Um, I, I truncated it off the screen, but here to the What? 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 Is everything against me now? Where's the highlighter? Huh, <laughs> strange. My shortcut button uh, or, or key press control zero and control one and control two wasn't working anymore in order to get my pointy hand here. So chapter seven is about power management and sleep modes. Here to the left I have the index of the data sheet which I truncated off the screen so I see it but you don't have to. And it tells us that there's several different sleep modes available. Oh, you don't see it even, sorry. Are you there? <laughs> um, power management and sleep modes. And uh, so there's a couple of different ones. And here it tells you what is actually still going on when our microcontroller is sleeping. And uh, we have these modes and we have the CPU clock, we have uh, the I.O. clock, we have the main clock, we have uh, the pin change interrupts for example and we have the um, I2C, we have the EE prom, we have the ADC, we have the watchdog timer, we have other I.O. and uh, so on. So depending on which mode we are in more and more of these functions get switched off and uh, so wouldn't be able to wake up our microcontroller. In order to actually make sleep modes easier to handle than actually going into the registers ourselves, there is a library which I briefly introduced on the last slide of the previous lecture. And uh, in the source code here, which I will right away copy into Atmel Studio, um, I'm actually including this library and we can have a look if we will find more information on this library as well. So AVR sleep.h gives us the documentation of this library. It has a couple of functions. It has uh, functions sleep enable, sleep disable, sleep CPU, sleep mode and sleep bot disable. BOD stands for brown 
without uh, detection, it would actually be possible to wake up a sleeping microcontroller if there's something wrong with the supply voltage so that you perhaps can do some last minute housekeeping before your microcontroller switches itself off because power is failing. Um, it, well, we, we have the short explanation of what these functions do. Uh, put the device into sleep mode, sleep CPU. And uh, the, the interesting thing is, Ah, okay, now, now I understand the, the difference between the sleep CPU and the sleep mode settings uh, function here. Um, I've always been using sleep mode, but sleep CPU would actually be enough in the code as you can see. So right. text to what's left is not visible. Oh yeah, that's true. Uh, text to the left is not visible. Thank you. Um, that's because I truncated away the half of the screen here. Uh, it's not half the screen, but some screen to actually show the PDF files better. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> anyway, you, you can, as you could see, if you want to find any information about anything, and this is not about only our AVR microcontroller, all microcontroller have their documentation online. Just ask Google. Um, you will find uh, information on all and every microcontrollers and all and every of their libraries by just googling. It's so comfortable nowadays. You don't have to have thick books um, with data sheets and stuff. I, a couple of years ago I threw out some old data sheet books. I still keep some historical ones but the uh, more recent ones I, I really threw out because everything is all available online now. So let's have a look at the code and uh, see what it does. Um, I will take this code here, Control A, Control C, and copy it into a new project, empty project, now it's empty at least, um, in Atmel Studio. Same would apply to Platform IO, of course or if you're compiling the code manually from the command line. The, we start by defining uh, for the compiler our CPU speed and we include as usual our io.h which tells the system or the compiler what microcontroller we have, what the different pins are, what the register names are and so on. Then I include the sleep library and the interrupt library. We have seen the interrupt library before when we were working with interrupts in lab I don't know which and uh, then I also include here the delay.h library. Let's have first a look and make this code a bit nicer again after pasting. Um, there is some oddness with some indentation when you copy and paste into Atmel Studio. Let's have a look at the main first here. It's a very short main. <coughs> we have the call to the function init, which does our hardware initialization. Then we have our infinite loop. And what I am doing in the infinite loop is I'm setting the port D bit one. That would be one of our two LEDs and I switch it on here, I have a delay te for 10 milliseconds and then I switch port D to zero. That would switch both LEDs off and here I then go to sleep with my microcontroller. And that would be it. I mean, if, if the microcontroller doesn't wake up anymore, then it would go through this loop exactly once and that would be it. If sleep mode wouldn't do anything, then we would see <coughs> the LED almost constantly on because it would be on for 10 milliseconds, then I would switch it off and then would, it would be, yeah, it, it would be off for a very short time, a couple of microseconds before it is switched on again. So it would look as if it was completely on. We can simulate this later by actually commenting out this row here. 
someone is drilling somewhere nearby. Very annoying. What did you say? Yes. It, it would imply that we are switching off the CPU functions in order to save power. And we will have a look into what it is still doing. Okay. So let's have a look at the init. So in the init, I switch on the output pins as output pins for the two LEDs. As you remember, we connected the LEDs to pins D0 and D1. So that would be the leftmost bits in our binary number here. And I put the weird number 31249 into the timer 1 register OCR1A. And I do some magic setting of the timer here. And uh, we might or might not have together a look into it, but I would also encourage you instead to actually try to figure out uh, what these timer settings are and what I'm, what mode I'm setting and what prescaler I'm setting. We'll have a time for this uh, after we get the code to run and then yeah, we will see how we exactly do it. The TIMSK1 register here, that will actually activate or enable a timer interrupt. It will actually enable the output compare interrupt. So whenever our timer reaches the value in the OCR1A, that's what the OC and 1A stands for, so whenever it reaches this value 31249 it will create an interrupt signal as mentioned earlier we have to disable the usb interrupts otherwise they will interfere with everything unless we also include the usb driver routines so i disable all usb interrupts so we cannot use usb communication at the same time there's also one thing you would hardly ever use a USB peripheral in sleep mode. There is really no big use into putting a microcontroller which is attached to a USB port into a sleep mode while it is attached to the USB port because the power consumption of a microcontroller with a couple of milliamps is so little that uh, you will actually not save much power in the total system when you have a 50 watt or so computer, um, at least 50 watts, and then you have a milliwatt microcontroller and put that one into a sleep mode. It really doesn't make sense. So um, yeah, using USB and sleep modes at the same time, very unlikely, I would say. Then I prepared four different uh, set sleep modes here. So with this command set sleep mode, we tell the sleep library into which of the data sheets sleep modes we want to put our microcontroller. And uh, wrong page here. And as we saw here, this means that in different of these modes, different of the peripherals will be on or off correspondingly. So if we switch back to this one, the first one here is the idle mode. And in idle mode, actually most of the peripherals are running. We have all clock sources enabled. Um, we have the I2C port enabled. We have the analog to digital converter enabled we have the outer ios enabled so essentially everything is running but the microcontroller would not execute code so that's what the idle mode is uh, the code execution is halted but the peripherals are still active inside our microcontroller then we have power down and power save um, power down and power save 
and in power down and power save we see that a lot of things are already switched off here here and here and here actually the more detailed description would tell you the difference between power down and save and then there's also one mode which is called standby so for different microcontrollers this would have different meanings but most modern microcontrollers support these different modes of sleeping either just halting code execution which is already a lot of power consumption uh, or even stopping all the peripheral functions as well so we will later test and see if we can use any of the other three modes here but we start by actually just halting the code execution and the last part here is the set interrupt enable for the global interrupts so we actually allow interrupts so this would mean now that every once in a while our timer one would generate an interrupt and what does this interrupt do well this interrupt actually inside the interrupt service routine which is linked to the comp a vector of timer one so the compare vector the compare interrupt a for timer one what I do here is I switch on the other LED by turning on this pin to a 1, the PD0. So what I'm expecting or what, what I know will happen now is actually that my, our microcontroller at this point here will turn on this LED and then it will go to sleep. And then after a while it will wake up from the sleep because the timer interrupt will wake up and restart the code execution. Then inside the interrupt service routine the other LED will be switched on. Then it will jump out of the interrupt service routine. It just was at the sleep mode uh, instruction so it would go and restart this loop, switch on the other LED wait for 10 milliseconds and switch both LEDs off and go to sleep again. And uh, well, I mean, let's see what this does if we put this into the microcontroller and then do some experiments with the code. Some more experiments. Exp experiments. Um, okay, code is compiled. It's a full 300 bytes of code. That's not much. And uh, let's go to Avia do this. And uh, it's the lab 8 file which I already prepared here. Um, I will double click my microcontroller. And now here it's COM7. And I will program the code. And I will show you what I see. I see two blinking LEDs. And what does it mean now which LED is which? Um, the left LED here is PD0. This is the LED which is switched on in the interrupt service routine. The right LED is the LED which is switched on in the main loop. And just by I don't know what happened. Oh, this is interesting. <laughs> this is interesting. Um, I can assure you that both LEDs are blinking all the time and steady. But sometimes I see at least on my screen here that the camera doesn't pick up the blinking. Um, probably because the 10 milliseconds which I'm blinking is quite short and uh, well but they are blinking steadily and they're blinking about how often any guess now they are they, they are blinking i assure you they are blinking <laughs> what is this Okay, I think I, I need to increase the on time of the LED so that the camera always catches on to them. 
Um, so what I will do, I transition here and I let them be on for 20 milliseconds instead. Oh, this, this was so unexpected. But of course, I mean, the, the camera has a certain, certain shutter time and uh, if the blinking falls in between the uh, time when the camera is actually taking in a picture, then we wouldn't see it. So now, now let's, let's see. So we, we don't see any time difference in, in the two LEDs. They seem to blink at the same time and for as long um uh, same same time blinking as well uh while of course we are switching on one in the interrupt service routine and the other one in the main loop here which also they are blinking they are blinking <laughs> okay let me try if, if I switch off this uh, light here the camera will have a longer exposure time uh, <laughs> okay um, so what, what I wanted to say is yes this one is the, the left one is switched on inside the interrupt service routine and the right one inside the main loop and they seem to always light up at the same time which means that the execution in the main loop is synchronized to our interrupts. So every time we get an interrupt, we also pass through this part of the code here. And this is because our microcontroller wakes up here and then goes through the code and comes back here and uh, then goes to sleep again. So that's what we see here. Now let's try to change the sleep mode. This was the sleep mode idle. So the microcontroller only holds. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh? Warte not, Eric. Ella. Nein, ich sehe die Koden. Ah, just ja. Die gehören nicht hinter. Why, why don't you see both things at the same time as I do here? It, yeah, I... Wait a second, let me take a screenshot. I will put this later on to Studium so that you see what I see and why I'm so confused that you don't see everything. Um, okay, so let's. Th this was the idle mode, so code execution is halted. Um, let's try and see what happens if we put the microcontroller into the so called power down mode here. And power down mode would then also happen here, so we would see, or perhaps not see, we, the LED would blink once, and uh, then it would go into sleep mode, and then the timer interrupt should wake it up again. So let's compile this code and uh, upload this code, transition you there. You might have seen, I mean, you, you can backtrack this, uh, the, the video file. This LED here was blinking once, this LED wasn't blinking at all. Let me repeat this. Uh, I just give the microcontroller a reset by just clicking once on the button here. And look, have a look at what happens on the two LEDs. So reset and this LED blinks once. And then our microcontroller goes into sleep and it misses its class because it doesn't wake up anymore. Um, when we have a look at the code, what happens is it went through the loop once it blinked the LED for 20 milliseconds and then it goes to sleep. But the problem with the uh, sleep mode which we are choosing now, the power down mode, is that even 
the timer is stopped. So in this particular mode, the timers are not running. Um, the I.O. clock is stopped, uh, the ADC clock would be stopped and this means that from neither of the other three modes we could wake up by a regular timer interrupt. There is a watchdog timer inside our microcontroller as well which has its own clock and actually as you can see here the watchdog timer could be used to wake up from any of these sleep modes but I spare you. We, 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 we will not together have a look. You can explore it on your own if you want to. Um, I haven't worked with the watchdog timer myself too much. Um, I used it in two projects of mine um, but normally I'm, I'm not really needing it. But this was so the, to show you that a regular timer interrupt can actually wake up a CPU from an idle mode when the code execution is halted, which we can use to actually save power. How much power we can save, as I said, I have to postpone this information um, because I would have to prepare a USB cable, a special USB cable where I can have a multimeter in series with the power cord. The, the ones which I have are simply not sensitive enough. So these are charge meters, the charger doctor and the Kivzi, I don't know. Um, they, you can put them in series with a USB cable and it will show you the current which goes through the cable. But the thing is they are simply not sensitive enough. They show nothing for the microcontroller itself running and then going from nothing to nothing is of course not very significant. But, uh, and, and yes, again, you didn't see them, did you? <laughs> so these are these power meters which you can have in series with a USB cable. But they show too little information. Um, but, oh, back here, sorry for the blinking. Uh, <laughs> um, we connected this button here as well. So let's see if we can wake up a sleeping microcontroller from a push button. So from an external event like uh, you pressing a button and this could for example be a remote control button. Uh, where you have your microcontroller completely sleeping, everything is switched off and when you press a button on the remote control you want your microcontroller to wake up, to send the code um, to the TV or stereo or whatever device you want to um, control with the remote control and afterwards you want to send the microcontroller to sleep again to save on your batteries. Um, my particular TV remote control, which I have at home, which is built around an 80 mega 32 8, uh, actually uses some, it, it has three AAA batteries inside and they last in average for two or three years. I had it now for two battery changes, so I, I'm not exactly sure you can find on my blog when I built that one. Um, so, yeah, let's see what we can do. And the function which we are looking at, are there, there are two ways to do this. There are certain pins on the microcontroller which have an external or generate an external interrupt signal. And then we also have the pin change interrupt pins. Um, I know my stupid face is in the way down here but there is nothing to see back behind my face here anyway. Um, all the interesting pins are visible. And what we have here, what we are looking at now are the dark gray pins. Um, it says interrupts here on the left. So we have int 0 to int 3 and we have PC int 0 to PC int 7 and PC stands for pin change while int just stands for interrupt. Uh, there, there's some small differences between these uh, functions. For example on the int pins we can change whether we want to create an interrupt when we 
go from high to low on a pin, from low to high, or either or. So, um, yeah, we could select only to generate an interrupt whenever we go from a high to a low, or from a low to a high, or both. While on the pin change interrupt uh, pins here, it will generate an interrupt whenever there is any change of state on this pin. So ever, whenever it goes from 1 to 0 or from 0 to 1, uh, we will create an interrupt. And how is this done? And what is the interesting uh, settings here um, in the data sheet? Wrong direction, probably. Here we have the I.O. ports in the data sheet, in the data sheet, in the data sheet. Um, here is the external interrupt control and here comes, no, not yet. If I, here comes the, so it's described obviously in chapter 11 in the data sheet and uh, the register which we have to look in, one into the, of the registers is the PCICR, the pin change interrupt control register. Um, and here it starts to, no, I cannot remember while I'm, I'm quite comfortable in remembering the names of the timer registers by now, I couldn't remember the PCICR uh, name. Probably I could when I used it more often. This register is an 8-bit register, but it only has one bit which is relevant for us. And this is the least significant bit here. Um, let me see if I can zoom a bit more. And uh, this bit here, the PCIe 0 bit, is the interrupt enable bit for the pin change interrupts. Why does it have so many um, bits here then if it only uses one? Well, the 80 mega 328, for example, uses three bits in this register because it has three banks of pin change interrupts. And then we have the pin change mask register. And here we can tell the microcontroller which of the eight pins which we just saw should be able to generate a pin change interrupt. We don't necessarily want all of them to be creating interrupts. So we can select just one of the pins in order to just get one interrupt signal. And uh, if you followed the instructions, then we connected the push button here to bit zero. And bit zero here, PB zero, is actually PC int zero. At least something is logical here. And this means that we have to set bit zero in the PC MSK zero register in order to enable interrupts on this push button. So let's have a look at the code that is in the lab08 code 2 file. Copy it and go here, control A, control V. And uh, if you look at the build up of the file, it is actually very similar, if not almost identical to what we just saw before. So the same libraries are included here, the io.h, the sleep.h, the interrupt.h and the delay.h. Here inside the PC int zero interrupt service routine, so the PC pin change interrupt zero um, service routine here sets the left LED of our two LEDs. This is what was previously in the interrupt service routine for the timer. So whenever we get this interrupt, we should see this LED light up. And in the main routine, we switch on the other LED I will actually increase the time here to 20 milliseconds to actually make sure the camera picks up everything. And then we switch off and then we go to sleep. This is exactly the same as we had before. 
So the only difference will be now that we want the system to wake up from an external event rather than a timer. And uh, let's start actually by looking into the idle mode here to have it to start like this. So then uh, this part here is also the same. What I do next here is I pull up the PB0 pin because I now have a switch connected to ground. I need to make sure that the pin itself is at a high level whenever we are not pressing the button. So when we are pressing the push button, it will go, into, go down to zero volts or a zero logical. And then when we release the button, it will go back up to one. Here I set the bit PCIe0 in the PCICR register, as we just saw in the datasheet. And here I set the bit PCint0 in the PCMSK0 register. And I disable the USB interrupts. So this part of the code is exactly the same, but we are looking at a different source of the wake up interrupt. So let us compile this code and bring it into the microcontroller. Chip. It's even shorter. It's 288 bytes because we only we don't need to initialize the uh, timer anymore. Okay, code should be uploaded and uh, this is the board. Let me see, I, I think I can switch on this light again. It's still a yellow taint today from the camera. Um, white balance off as usual. And uh, now when I push this button, I should be able to generate the pin change interrupt and then inside the interrupt service routine, this LED should be switched on. And in the main loop, this LED should be switched on. And also what, what I can show you first is whenever the microcontroller starts code execution, it will go once through the main loop and switch on the right LED. So if I just press the reset button once, then we should see this LED blink once. Did you see that? Um, Eric didn't because he wasn't looking. <laughs> So if I press the reset button, we see the right LED flash exactly once when we go for the first time through the main loop. But what happens now if I press our new button here? Um, when I press it, we see both LEDs light up for a quarter second, uh, 20 milliseconds. And when I release the button, um, we also see them blinking. I saw them blinking. You didn't. Uh, yeah. I, I, if, if you connect this up yourself, you will not have these camera problems and you actually will see that they always blink when you press down the button or when you release a button. And this is because both of those will actually create an interrupt, a pin change interrupt, which then makes uh, the processor wake up, go through the interrupt service routine first, switch on this LED, and then it will come back and go through the main loop and uh, switches on the other LED, waits for 20 milliseconds, and then goes to sleep again. And uh, so now, now we are still using the idle mode. This was what the mode which uh, also worked with the timer interrupt. So the only thing which is halted is actually the code execution. But uh, we can try, or we can test now if we can go to a different sleep mode. In the power down and power safe modes, both of these modes essentially all the peripherals, all the timers, everything is switched off inside our microcontroller. Uh, the only thing which is still active is the interrupt logic, which then should be able to wake up our microcontroller. And let's see, so this is now the modified code and uh, still I can wake up the microcontroller by the press of a button. 
and yeah it would be really nice to show you and uh, to, to see actually that the power consumption is significantly lower this way um, as i said i will try to wire this up for the for one of the q and a sessions either today or tomorrow how fast can you trigger these interrupts uh, well essentially as fast as you can press the button this is about as fast as i can do it here um, so let's have a break and after the break uh, we'll have a look at something no yes no yes there's one more interrupt code wasn't there no there wasn't so after the break we have a look at, at something completely different yes <laughs> confused here it's at nine o'clock in the morning um, at these leds which you also have in your boxes which are actually interesting because they have four legs why do they have four legs after the break need more coffee
rätta knappen här nu. Nej, där. Så. Klick. Ja! Yeah. <laughs> request even. Yes. Yes. I, I mean, I, I did this for the 80 mega 32.8 and uh, that is actually um, in the slides. Um, wh when it comes to this unit here, I wonder, I wonder, I wonder. The, the difficulty is that the USB will not cannot run I, I have to look up something i i think there is a function in the processor which i could use um good good idea absolutely good idea um let me check something in the data sheet i can actually have you participate um and we go to the system clock and clock options here because in the good old 80 mega 32.8, which we used in the course before, you can only set the clock division by eight in a fuse when you are programming the microcontroller. And you can do this on the 80 mega 32 U4 as well. The problem would then be that I would lose the capability of USB programming with a bootloader because at one megahertz I cannot run the USB anymore. Um, but the question is whether I can flip this bit in software. And I think it is possible. Um, The, 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 the high speed timer clock USB clock clock sources. Fuse bits, yes, so these cannot be changed. Clock start up sequence. Low frequency, internal calibration, external clock. The device includes a clock switch controller that allows user to switch from one clock source to another one by software in order to control application power and execution time with more accuracy. Modification went with external clock to the calibrated RC oscillator. Can only be used to switch between calibrated 8 MHz RC oscillator, external clock, low power crystal. Okay. System clock prescaler. Ah, uh, yes. The AVR USB has a system clock prescaler, and the system clock pen can be divided by setting the clock. Brrr. This feature can be used to decrease, decrease the system clock frequency and the power consumption when the requirement for processing power is low. This can be used with all clock source options, and it will affect the clock frequency of the CPU and all synchronous peripherals. Yes, of course. When switching between prescaler settings, the system clock prescaler ensures that no glitches occurs 
in the clock system it also ensures that no intermittent frequency is higher than okay yes okay so let's have a look These bits define the division factor between the selected clock source and the internal system clock. These bits can be written runtime to vary the clock frequency. The, the fuse, the, okay, so what options do we have? 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, and 256. I will definitely do this, Daniel, and everyone else here as well. Uh, so, um, I, I only had br I, I, when when I was looking into my problems with the USB and discovered that in order to have the USB working, I have to have either eight or sixteen megahertz, but not twelve. Then I actually was reading part of this chapter about the clock system clock options here in the data sheet. And I remembered seeing that there was a way to actually, lower the clock frequency dynamically from software in the 80 mega 32 u4 something which is not possible in many other of the avr microcontrollers but so in this one we have the ability to actually choose the 8 megahertz clock we can choose 8 megahertz divided by 2 which is 4 by 4 which is 2 by 8 which is 1 half a megahertz uh, one quarter of a megahertz, one eighth of a megahertz, one and 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 so on. One eighth, one sixteenth, and one thirty second of a of a megahertz. So um, this should give us some measurement points of the power consumption at different clock frequencies. Uh, but again, for this, I also will have to wire up the multimeter in series with USB cable, which I will do directly after this session. So that probably um, already after lunch, uh, this could be working. If I fail, then it should be working tomorrow. And uh, so that's interesting. Absolutely interesting. Um, and many other modern microcontrollers allow you to do the same thing. Um, many modern processors allow you to do the same thing and not only in steps of uh, a factor of two but uh, you might know that most processors most pc processors intel amd and arm or whatever you have in your the intel atom i don't know what else is around uh, qualcomm processors in pcs um, and mobile phones, they can dynamically change the clock frequency on a very fine scale, actually, to 2.5, 2.8, 3 gigahertz. And so this, this is a bit more brutal, but then on the other hand, we, we have a microcontroller here, not a PC. So, but uh, let's have a look and wire up uh, these strange looking LEDs and for this we go to the smart LED page um, because these LEDs are actually so-called neopixels and uh, what that means is that they contain a small controller chip which actually allows us to send data to the LED in order to change its color because inside the LED and I have shown you in the lecture on serial communication I've shown you the inside of such an LED uh, there is actually a red a green and a blue chip like the pixels on your screen and essentially you could actually make them light up in any color and they are series connected. So um, we have a data coming in on one side here. Let me see if I, and how far I can go when I, so like this. We have data coming from the microcontroller. I chose in the code PB7 as the output pin from the microcontroller. And it goes into the 
pin labeled D in on the LED. If you look at the LEDs, you will see that they have two shorter and two longer legs. And so if you keep the LED in your fingers exactly as they are shown here, then you have the D in on the left, then comes the positive supply voltage, ground, and then comes a pin which is called D out. And this is where we actually daisy chain the LEDs. So the data out from the first LED goes into the data in of the second and so on. You have three of these LEDs in your boxes and uh, let's connect three of these LEDs like this. So on the breadboard I ripped off everything which we had there before and uh, I put in the first LED and I put it in to four subsequent columns here. Um, I will zoom down a little bit more here to show you more clearly what I'm doing. So this is the first LED and just grab it out again. So the short legs are to the left in here. And then the rightmost leg of this LED is the D out pin, which should go into the leftmost pin of the next LED. So if, they, if I stagger them like this, that they overlap in one pin, then I don't need another wire to do this. So the leftmost pin of this LED is connected to the rightmost pin of this LED because they are in the same column here. And, oops, sorry, I will try to find the next LED here. It's this one. And I also do it the same way over here. So now the series communication uh, of the three LEDs is fixed and now we have to connect power and ground to these LEDs and uh, for this I will take the pin number two of oh, the, the pin number two of all these LEDs and connect to the red strip on the side here I will use red cables for this and another one from this LED like this and I then will use it it's getting a bit crowded here um, I'm now going and connect pin number three to ground for all of these which is the blue strip uh, short black one here's a short black one from here to there and a last short black one please there's another one going from here to here so this is the, <laughs> the bunch of wires now what was that? I heard a bang on my computer, something, I don't know. Hmm. Don't know. Um, so now the first data pin here, the leftmost pin of the whole arrangement, should go to B7 over here. Take a yellow wire for this. And then I previously only connected the minus strip here, the blue strip to ground. I now will find the plus three volts, which is down here and connect that one to the red strip. And if everything works like yesterday, then actually the LEDs will jump to life immediately. Um, yes, they do. Um, they are all blue right now. And the uh, same thing happens yes, happened yesterday. This must be some built-in reset logic of these particular um, NeoPixels. Uh, I have not seen this happening with other LEDs. No resistor. No, um, because uh, the resistor is actually built into these. So these are not uh, any standard LEDs. 
Um, so they, they are, um, the, the individual LED chips are actually connected um, internally and have current limiting internally inside these housings. But uh, so, so now it, right now it looks as if these are just uh, blue LEDs. Um, but let's have a look at the code and uh, take, take some programs, some things with it. Uh, so I have prepared code number three, which you will find on Studium. Um, example code number three and example code number four. Uh, here down there under the description. Here you have also the data sheet of the uh, NeoPixels. I will open this one up as well. Um, open with Firefox um, just to show you what we are dealing with here. It's an intelligent control LED integrated light source. Um, and uh, what does it say here? 256 brightness display, 16 million color, full color display, scan frequency not less than 400 hertz per second. Hertz per second is a very interesting unit, I find. Um, <coughs> uh, yes, so um, actually here you can see how this, these chips look if they are in surface mount uh, packages. Inside you would see a chip with wires going off and a blue, a green and a red LED uh, connected to this chip and you have the data in and the data out and you have VCC, VSS and VDD. Um, interesting. Oh yeah, that, that's the, the ones with separate LED supply voltage which we don't have. And uh, here you see what uh, we have to do to send data. Um, there is actually a way to send a zero and a way to send a one. Essentially, a zero is sent by sending a short time high pulse followed by a long time low and a one is a long time high followed by a short low. And how, how long is long, how long is short, it's actually given in this table here. The 0h, so this time here, the 0 high time should be 0.35 microseconds plus minus 150 nanoseconds. And then the corresponding uh, low is actually 0 0.8 microseconds. And for the uh, 1, it's essentially reverse. So it's 0.7 microseconds, so a longer time on, and 0.6 microseconds, so a shorter time off. And uh, 0.35 microseconds is quite short. And uh, if we would run our microcontroller at just a megahertz, which we used to do in the previous um, times I had the course with the separate 80 mega, then it's actually too short, too slow. One megahertz is one microsecond per instruction cycle. We couldn't flip a pin for 0.35 instruction cycles. That's impossible. But uh, for us now, actually, this is possible because we are running a microcontroller which is eight times faster. So let's have a look and see what I did in the code. Um, so we have this left three code here, control A, control C, control A, control V. I actually uh, have a new library which I included here, which is the string.h and you will see I, I use it actually for, for one particular reason. Um, here we have the data direction register for port B and this is where we connected our LEDs to now and I switch on the highest bit uh, to be an output. So this is PB7 here. I could also write this as, um, oh, 
as shifting a one to the position pb7 exactly the same thing and uh, then in the main i actually didn't forget to actually call the init as well as i sometimes did um, i define some variables here let's have first a look what happens else i wait for a second in the beginning of the main loop here and then i have nested four loops um, three nested for loops why do i have three nested for loops here and why are they all counting the, the first ones here to three or zero one two zero one two um, this is the outermost is for the individual leds which we have connected and the next one is for the three colors within each led looking back at the data sheet It tells us that we are sending out 24 bits per LED. This is 8 bits for the red, 8 bits for the green and 8 bits for the blue LED. And uh, then actually the first LED connected to the bus or to the data output from our microcontroller, the first LED will grab the first 24 bits it sees on the transmission and set its own color to the corresponding uh, intensity values for the three base colors and then every new bit which it receives over the yellow cable it just sends on to the next led and the next led will see oh here comes bits uh, actually 24 bits later than the first led and it will grab the first 24 bits it sees on this data stream and uh, keep this you could do it in one loop as well samuel yes absolutely this is not about efficiency this is more about clarity <laughs> there, there are different ways of doing this um and uh, the, the, this uh, actually yeah what i want to show you there's two things i want to show you here but uh, let, let exactly you could do everything in a single loop well uh, probably you will still need two loops we'll have a look at that in a second um and then the next led this one gets the last 24 bits which we are sending but we could go on sending bits you can actually buy these leds in uh, strips um in the very begin in one lab in the beginning i actually showed you this led ribbon cable here um, in order to actually show you that we could switch on and off quite a current with a single transistor uh, you can buy these led types in the same types of ribbons where each of these individual leds is one of these smart leds and then you can have five meters or so of this ribbon and you can control all of the individual LEDs by just sending enough bits over this first wire until you have the information for the last LED out. It says in the description, I saw something about 512 um, in high, okay, not less than 1024 points and actually that is true there's videos on youtube which i might link to if i haven't done this already yeah there's one link already in the lecture slides for the theory data transmission um, you can have meters and meters of these or you can actually arrange them in a matrix display as well or in a cube a bachelor student project this year was actually building up a four by four by four cube out of these leds exactly the same leds wiring them all together soldering them all together and then controlling all the individual leds having a very low resolution 3d display i mean four by four by four isn't that much but it's actually 64 leds which you have to solder together already um, so that was quite a work by itself um so going back to the code then here is the code so we have one loop here this is 
each new pixel. The next loop is each color in a new pixel. And now we have actually a variable dummy here which gets copied the contents of the uh, array LEDs j i. So this is an array which I initialize with the values 255 0 0, 0 255 0 and 00255. 0, 0, so this is the first LED, the first NeoPixel with color component A, B and C and the second NeoPixel and the third NeoPixel. And uh, then I copy this data for the selected color information of the selected LED. So this, the outer loop here is taking the J's and the inner ones is the I. And then I go through the eight bits inside this <laughs> Thumbs up. Yes, I, I saw a comment poking up here. And so Eric is much faster than I am here. <laughs> um, great. So if this, the highest bit in this number dummy is set, then I switch on the pin for 0 0.7 microseconds and do another wait here for 0 0.6 microseconds. What I do not account for here is the time it takes to execute these commands themselves. But you will see or you I can actually see on Eric's board already um, that it is good enough. Um, so these LEDs are tolerant enough for actually slight deviations. Actually it's at plus minus 150 nan uh, nanoseconds. Um, so it, it seems to work at least. And, but if this highest bit is a zero, then I'm switching on for 0.3 microseconds and off for 0.8 microseconds before shifting the eight bits in the dummy variable one position to the left. And going through this loop again and doing this for all the eight bits for each of the colors and then for all the three colors in a NeoPixel and then for all the three NeoPixels in our string here. Then in order to get some life into it, I do something with the uh, contents of the array. I'm actually shifting the whole array here. So showing you how the, that there's a function memcopy which copies memory structures or data in the memory. This is just a complete shift of the information inside this array here. So we take the first block here and move it to the last position. That's, exact, that's essentially what this loop down here does. So let's compile the code. And that was faster than expected. Um, and upload the code. And yeah, my, my camera is actually not picking up the colors too well, but if you, if you, or when you connect this yourself, you will see the clear um, blue, green and red color here. And if I just follow the red, it goes uh, in a sequence through the three LEDs here. And uh, this is just turning all the LEDs on full power. Um, so this is full power red, full power green and full power blue. But we can, act we can actually um, do something else with these LEDs. We can, as I said, individually control all the three color components of all the three LEDs in the same way. And uh, just to show you another um, way of, of modding uh, the, the code, the second code here, the, the code 04, 
will do exactly this. It will just do another control A, control V, another thing with the uh, color components. Uh, but the the central part here sending the data to the individual LEDs is exactly the same. So if the color bit is set here, if the highest bit is set, then we are sending a long one and a short zero. And if it's a zero, then we are sending a short one and a long zero. And uh, compiling this code as well and uh, uploading it. What we have now is a fading of all the three colors um, because that's what the second part of this loop does. Uh, what you can also see is that actually um, these particular LEDs are wired up uh, so that the first byte which we send is red, the second byte which we send is green and the third one is blue as in RGB. Many of the LED strips and many of these LEDs have actually the colors uh, mounted in a different order. So. Um, depending on which one of these you get when you control them, you might have to change uh, which color information is red, green and blue for the individual uh, NeoPixels because that's defined by the actual manufacturer of the LED, not by the chip itself. Um, the chip can be used with any of these configurations. Let me just see... I want to show you the image of how these LEDs look like. If you look under a microscope, um, looking, 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 browsing through my course files here. Oh, that's a nice picture. Eh. No. If I only had sorted my pictures in a certain way. Uh, I cannot find it, cannot find it, cannot find it, cannot find it. But you can have a look, as I said, in the lecture notes on the serial communication. There you will find it. Ah, that's weird. It should be here somewhere. Oh, it's perhaps under LEDs. Perhaps it's sorted away. <laughs> why, why would I sort my files? That would be too easy. <laughs> yes, it would be too easy. Here it is. <laughs> okay. Um, let me see if you see me. Um, no, you don't. So, if, if you don't have the milky construction that we have, but a clear uh, coating on top of the LEDs itself, then you would see something like this, where this over here is actually a silicon chip, which gets the data into uh, one of these wires and it gets power from one or two of these wires. And then you see the individual LED chips mounted here. This is one of the colors. This is a second one and this is a third one here. Um, these two are red, uh, green and blue. And this one is the red one. How do I know this? The um, green and blue actually have two wires on the top. And this is because of the construction of the LED material. 
um, they are actually grown on an insulating sapphire substrate um, so you have to supply both the positive and the negative side to the LED by wires from the top while the red LED here is actually connected from the bottom with the one wire or one connection and the top with the other connection but these three wires here send the information then or the the actually it's a PWM coded signal um, which they are sending to the individual LED chips uh, so that they can light up at different intensities. And uh, the PWM frequency for these is above 400 Hertz, it says in the data sheet. That's why it looks as if they were continuously dimming. But uh, actually, as you might see from the interference pattern on the camera, there's some striping going on in this direction here and this is again because of some interference between the shutter time of the camera and the actual switching on and off of the individual LEDs here. Um, but yeah, so uh, the, the interesting thing is that actually we are, or well the Chinese who did this are actually possible it, that it's possible today to mount everything like this into a single LED package and uh, then sell it for a cost which is, well, it is significantly higher than a single LED, but it's still incredibly cheap. Um, I don't know what I paid for these now, but uh, actually they were on sale. Um, that's why I added them to the boxes in the last minute. I got them from a different source. Um, yeah, uh, so this is this is this part of the lab. Um, I also promised you uh, actually in the lecture to also connect and show you these OLED screens here. And... Uh, we have still 12 minutes and the code is there and uh, well, let's do it. So unless there's questions, but you can also ask questions later in the Q&A sections and you can always ask questions by email. Um, but let, let's have a look at the OLED display as well. Um, so if we go to studio and go to I think I can go just back here. Yes, I could. I could, I could. Here's a page on the OLED display. And what we have on the OLED, so, so first in the box you will find this, this flat ribbon cable um, with this type of connector on both sides. It is actually polarized, so you can only fit it in one direction into the side which is on the back of the OLED module here. And then on the other side, you will have the same indication by this indentation here, uh, which will mark where pin 1 is. There's also, um, if you look very closely, you will see this small triangle here and you see the red wire. So one of the 10 wires in this cable is actually red and this marks the wire 1. Then we have 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, up to 10. For some reason they are not starting numbering by 0 um, but by 1 and that, that's okay as well. But so different from our loops normally. Um, so this is pin 1 and if we look at the instructions here we see that we only have to connect four wires to this connector and you can use your standard breadboard wires by just plugging them into the connector like this. So I connected the red wire to pin 1 and the black wire to pin 2. This will be 3.3 uh, volts and ground. And then I use a yellow and a blue wire uh, for actual data transfer. This display uses I2C communication. 
And so we have SCL as the yellow wire here on pin number five and the SDA on pin number six. I will rip off everything from this board here again, like this. And then we will connect uh, this to the corresponding pins on our microcontroller. And uh, the we go back to the view here. And so the yellow wire now is SCL. And if we look at the pinout, SCL is the same as D0. So we go back to when we used I2C. It's the uppermost two data pins on this side here. So SCL is D0. The yellow wire goes to D0 and the blue wire goes to D1. And the switching you back here. So yellow wire goes to D0, blue wire to D1. And then we have ground goes to ground and we have VCC goes to 3.3 um, volts here. And uh, yeah, well, fits almost on the screen here. And uh, then we'll have a look at the code examples. We will need the I2C master and TWEI master.h and .c files. We will need the SSD 1306 H and C files. SSD 1306 is the name of the controller chip sitting in this display. And I also have a 6x8 pixel font file here. And uh, I have the lab 6 code 3 as I called it here. So let's try to get all these files. Um, and put them somewhere. Save file. S and uh, no, no, no. Epsola projects courses, microcontroller programming, 2020, labs, lab 8, save. Okay, one back. I should right click that it's, that is actually faster, I don't know. Um, but now it should remember at least where it saves the file. Yes, it does. So one back and the this one, this one. Ah, what where did I click now? No, I didn't want to go back. I want to go forward. Which one? Okay, let's start from the top here. Save link as does this work? No, it doesn't. So open a new tab open in a new tab and open in a new tab. So let's get these ones. So the .c file, save it. The .h file, save it. The twi master, save it. Oh, 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 sorry. And this one. Save it. Ton of files. Um, okay. Let's have a look if we have everything. We have, sort by name, we have the font, we have the i2c master.h, we have the twi master.c, and we have the ssd 1306 i to C, C and H, and we have the lab six code three file there. So as you see, I originally intended to show you this in lab six, but for some reason, well, didn't manage to. And uh, now let's see if we can include all this in our project here. I right click on the 
project in the solution explorer add existing item for platform io you have to copy the files uh, manually and now i have to find the files which is actually same thing as where i stored them so it's in Uppsala projects courses um, microcontroller programming 2020 autumn labs lab 8 and now i select this one i select this one i select this one i select this one and this one um, and i say add and the last file the code itself i open separately it's open no it's not open this is empty is yours empty as well it's zero kilobytes file that that's not match did i upload an empty file to studium anyone else who can confirm or unconfirm it's not empty save file save yes what happened there Open with programmer's notepad. Now it's not em not not so empty. Okay, admin studio, control A, control V. And uh, yes, so the SSD 1306 library file contains everything which you need to actually put things onto a display with this microcontroller or microcontroller display controller on it and uh, so we have a function for setting a pixel we have a function for clearing a pixel we have a function to put a character somewhere somewhere to print something and to scroll even the display um, not all of them are tested though but uh, these are the basic functions. I obviously wrote this a while ago. This is quite a common display controller. And uh, what I'm doing here in this particular code is just using the put char function of the library. So let's compile it and see if it works today so that you know if you want to make a project with a microcontroller with a display not a micro with a display like this that you have at least a starting point of code um, program and here it goes and uh, switch this one off here and bring you closer to the display here it is oh 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 oh, oh there um, and you see this tiny spot running around here and I, I showed this in one of the Q&A sessions actually before but I didn't record it uh, so th this is actually this is the x and y position on the screen and so in this part of the code it sets a single pixel at all of the 128 by 64 positions on the screen to just demonstrate the use of a of, of the set pixel and clear pixel function here so you can try to chase this um, so yes it's a tiny display when it comes to the resolution uh, it, it's quite good but it, it yeah it, it, it's a tiny font uh, as well um, it's up to your imagination to actually come up with bigger fonts uh, for this there is actually nice libraries out there which use bigger fonts as well um, 
but many of them are actually written in Arduino and uh, then yeah you can convert them by actually going back to the original stuff. So here you see the full font and then it starts over by actually tracing tracing this little dot over the screen. So that, that was it for today. Um, and uh, I don't know about any idea of a homework project, but let's see first. Let, let's see how, how your homework from last week will work out. The deadline is today midnight. Um, I think that will be enough to actually uh, examine the lab part together with the first uh, quizzes which we had as well. And if there's anything, uh, we have a Q&A session after lunch and we have another Q&A session tomorrow. And uh, then on Friday, we already have the last lecture. And on Monday, there is a seminar scheduled um, for one half of uh, the courses. So I'm com not completely sure which of the two it actually is now. I have look to look into it, if it's a five or the 10 credit one. Um, we will see. I think it's... A, I'm, I'm not sure. But uh, this is actually to meet the students from one of the courses separately and then either discuss the projects or discuss questions and topics, summarize the course questions and topics for the upcoming exam in the five credit course. I cannot imagine or I cannot realize how it can already be the end of the course. I have just started to getting fun of this again, but uh, yeah, I hope you had some fun so far and uh, we'll explore a bit, little bit of this code and these devices and parts and uh, learn by doing. For now, I say goodbye and uh, perhaps see you after lunch. Uh, otherwise, see you tomorrow or on and on Friday. And I don't know where the other 55 or so students are. I have no idea. <laughs> Goodbye.